Hey, it is Freedom Friday trading and it's free and we're in the dome and it's uh, Friday. So welcome. It's healing relationships and uh, everything is relative to you and we want to heal the interference, clear the interference between you and what you're connected to and through. And it all starts with one relationship. Now, by the way, put your questions in the Q&A session here. We'll be taking Q&A as always during training. If you want my book, ebook, audio book, or a signed copy, I'll ship it to you. I'll pay for it. Not a problem. Or the exercise from today, healing relationships or the five daily practices, whatever you want. David at dmelzer.com. Put it in the chat, David at dmelzer.com. Ask the questions. We'll get to all of those here. IG, Clubhouse, all over every platform. Okay. The first relationship, and we're going to move from relativity to relativity. The first and most important relationship is the one with you, the relationship with yourself. Uh, and this relationship with yourself is complex. It's either love, hate, or somewhere in between at times. And the only exception is someone that is sociopathic and egotist and a narcissist that only loves themselves. Uh, but most people sit somewhere in between that love and hate relationship. And, uh, you know, I, I tell a story, I'm going to tell it again here for everyone. Uh, when I realized that I hated myself, um, I had been blessed in my life, millionaire nine months out of law school, uh, multimillionaire married to my dream girl by the time I was 30, believing money buys loves and happiness. My dad had warned me at 30 that money doesn't buy love or happiness. He gave me a jacket with no pockets. And I actually told him I hated him, that he was a liar, a cheater, manipulator, overseller, back end seller. And I hated him, that I was nothing like him. Why would you give me this jacket after 20 years of not giving me a birthday present? What kind of lesson is this? Why would you punish me? And six years later, I end up my wife telling me she's not happy with me, that I wasn't paying attention to the family, to my business. And she was worried that I had lost my character, that I'd lost taking stock in who I was and what I had become. In other words, I hated myself and I wasn't ready for that message either. And I said, you know what, I'm going to show her, I'm going to take her happiness away. And that jacket, that jacket was the reminder, the remembrance, the recollection of my values because it reminded me that I didn't hate my father, that I didn't hate my wife, that I needed to heal only one relationship with myself. I hated myself. And although to the outer world, I ran the most notable sports agency in the world. I was a multimillionaire with access to everything and everyone that I wanted to have access to and through, I was miserable because I did not heal the relationship with myself. I was living in liability and blame and shame and justification instead of that accountability about what did I do to attract all this to myself and what am I supposed to learn from and with that. I've healed my relationship with myself and got rid of that by shifting the paradigm in my life to receiving so I can give. Uh, understanding money uh, does not buy love or happiness, but it allows us to shop. And I learned to shop for the right things, the things that would make me happy to receive those things and appreciate them, to add my value to them and then give them away to heal the relationship, not only with self, but with the relationship with what I'm receiving from the greatest source of light, love and lessons through me with appreciation for me to add value, to heal the relationship with other people who are most relative to me and prioritizing those people that were most relative to me. Because a lot of times we care more about or tend to spend more time with, at least visiting with people that we don't know or we barely know, instead of those people that are most relative to us because we have not healed the relationship with that. And I found out why so many people struggle to do that. Uh, I had a negative perception uh, of this idea of healing, right? It, to me, had a religious connotation to heal. You know, I thought of the leap of faith, you know, you are healed. But healing is just a shift in a paradigm. If you want to be healed, what you want to do is find who you are. You are healthy, wealthy, 
you are worthy, you are happy. What are you doing to interfere with that? How can we heal that? And therefore, you will be healed by clearing the interference, using the stop, drop, and roll, understanding the triggers of the ego that create the interference, the need to be right, offended, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty, all of these different things that create interference that we need to heal. Healing is the clearing of that which interferes with you and the greatest source of light and love and lessons and everything else. Robert Holden said, your relationship with yourself sets the tone for every other relationship that you have. You need to excavate your feelings for yourself and healing for yourself so you can elevate yourself. You need to excavate yourself in order to elevate yourself. Trauma is one of the biggest causes in problems with self-esteem. Self-esteem is loving yourself. Uh, numerous types of trauma are often dismissed and it doesn't go away. That's why we need to excavate ourselves in order to find the trauma that's hidden underground. And the cause of these traumas create interference or uh, the lack of love of self and this idea of toxicity within oneself cured by or healed by some sort of secular separation. Uh, is not going to happen. Uh, we put undue pressure on ourselves to be good enough. See, we attach our emotions to an outcome, one that's usually put upon us by family, friends, other people, and then we don't feel like we are enough. Instead of enjoying the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of our own potential, of what we want, we are determined to try to please other people, try to please what's missing, what we don't have, instead of truly focusing in on ourselves, that excavation to elevate. If you make friends with yourself, you'll never be alone. That loneliness, the need to please other people for approval with other people, change those foes to Joes, the fear of missing out, the fear of other people's opinion. Change it to Jomo, the joy of missing out, the joy of other people's opinion. You will be with yourself your entire life. Remind yourself that. You will be with yourself your entire life. Why not love yourself? Why not make friends with yourself? I know that this may sound silly and obvious, but it is one of the most important relationships, if not all relationship in your life, because without that relationship, you cannot heal the relationships you have with that great source of light, love, and lessons that provides you the power and liberation and others. So, how do we do that? Well, let's imagine someone moved in down the street from you. They dressed and behaved in an intriguing way. It didn't take them too long to connect with the other neighbors. As you watched from your kitchen window, you saw them enjoying their life and having fun with the neighbors and you yearned to meet them and get in on the fun, but you were scared. This leaves you with the decision to go after what you want or let fear steal this away from you. What do you decide? Look at friending yourself in that way. You're an amazing person. How can you say that about yourself? Because you know that amazing people are connected to and through the greatest source of love and lessons and what happens if life throws crap on us and we can't see the amazingness? What happens if those eager ego-based triggers create interference where we lose sight of our light, our liberated self? And friending ourselves starts with the decision to reach out to yourself with four things. Number one, gratitude. Be grateful within yourself. Be grateful for your health, your wealth, your happiness. Be grateful for the superpowers and super strengths and supernatural abilities that you have. And be grateful for your weaknesses that can be transposed and transcend into different locations and turned into strength. Be grateful. Have the perception of self to find the light, the love, and the lessons in yourself. Not allowing anyone that laughs at you, scoffs at you, makes fun of you to affect you at all. Because eventually, if you love yourself, if you are friends with yourself, if you like yourself, they will applaud you. Sooner or later, those that 
laugh and they'll either applaud or fall away because your vibration, your frequency is like a shield, a Teflon shield that keeps the judgments and the conditions that affect you away from you, that clears the interference between you and what you already are, you and yourself, you and your potential, which allows you then to communicate effectively with no interference between you and the greatest source that provides you all that light, love and lessons and everything else. Um, Maltz said that if you make friends with yourself, you'll never be alone. Loneliness is the biggest cause of depression, anxiety, and fear. Why? Because when we feel alone, we feel separate from, separate from what? Separate from the most powerful source of life, love, and lessons. We feel separate from that which made the mountains. That's what created the obstacles, voids, and shortages. We feel separate from the greatest source that puts enough power in your pinky to light up Manhattan. We feel separate from that and we feel alone. But if you love yourself, if you're friends with yourself, you will never be alone. I used to be afraid of being alone, which is an indicator that I didn't love myself. I had grown up, you know, six kids in a two bedroom apartment, so I didn't know what it was like to be alone, but I was afraid to be alone and I didn't like to be alone. I always wanted to be around other people and please them. It took a long time to learn to love myself. It's amazing when you want everyone to love you, they won't. If you learn to love yourself, everyone will love you. Uh, it's amazing. I remember years ago, I went to a small gathering at a friend's house and in connection uh, with a group of people and I didn't know many of the people there as often happens and in their effort to get to know me they asked uh, questions and one of them left me stunned without an answer. What did they ask? They asked me what I did for fun when I wasn't working. That's a question that I've used in my trainings and my entering program for years. What do I like to do for fun when I wasn't working? And it was amazing because from that time on, I realized that there was only activity. Activity I got paid for and activity I didn't get paid for. That there was fun in everything. That my objective of one, doing my best, two, learning lessons, and three, having fun, could be applied to all activities within the context of the 24 hour of man-made time that I've been given in order to be productive, accessible, and gracious with that time. And through that, I exposed all of the childhood trauma and past life trauma that had burdened me with this interference, this lack of connectivity that made me feel alone. Uh, trauma, allows you to heal yourself. It takes the value from the self and the joy out of life. Healing restores the inherent value of self and brings a joy that makes you feel empowered so that you can give it away to empower others, to empower others to be happy. Yourself, the happiness, health, wealth, and worthiness that you are is the most powerful part of your soul. It allows the connectivity between the cells, C-E-L-L, -L, and the soul. It allows you to clear that interference that makes you feel separate from inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, guilty, angry, resentful, all of those different things. Your power of choice is the greatest gift that you've been given. And make the choice to love yourself and to be a friend of yourself. Now, you know that healing relationship with yourself will restore your power and give you the choices and opportunities and options to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy because you already are. How do we heal a broken relationship? Now, even if we love ourselves, we have snapshots of ourselves from uh, a history of our journey. And we have not acted appropriately in all relationships, nor have people that we've been in relationships act appropriately at all times. We may have had the greatest intention to do our best and to learn something and have fun, but in order to do that, we have to make a lot of mistakes and sometimes it creates interference and breaks that relationship. So I use a spectrum of relationship to determine, regardless of the snapshots that I have historically in those relationships, 
to understand what time, attention, and intention I'm going to give to those relationships. And the criteria that I use is one of feeding. I'm going to pay attention and give intention to the most, those that feed me. Those that feed me in all senses from cell to soul. Those that feed me in the power of the light, the lessons. Those that feed me with kindness and joy and positivity. Those that feed me will be fed by me. And then those that don't feed me in varying degrees, I will create distance between me and them. And the nice thing about today is it's easy to create distance because there's so many things to distract us. Whether it's family, friends, associates, neighbors, etc. There's so many things we can do to create distance and just allow those that don't feed us to fall away. And then, as a non-negotiable, those that bleed me, I either separate by a great distance or actually fire them if I can't separate myself with that distance. These are the varying degrees of broken relationships. These are the ways to maximize those relationships so that you don't have extra interference between you and what you already are. You and that health. You and that wealth. You and that happiness. You and that worthiness. All of the four criteria that make you the best friend that you'll ever have. The friend that you love so much. The humble friend that can ask for help and provide help to others. We need to heal these broken relationships and it can be tough, especially because we're relying on two parties in order to heal that relationship. It's easier to heal the relationship with self because there's one party involved or that in which we connect through the great source of light, love and lessons. Uh, but I've come up with a few ways to heal those relationships um, to allow you to save and rebuild and start anew despite or instead of the snapshot that people have of you. Uh, I'll give another example of this snapshot because so many people are judged or conditions are placed upon them because of the snapshots that they have uh, been taken. And one of those things uh, happened to me. I did a 50 for 50 campaign and my uncle who the majority of the time he has spent with me is from 13 until uh, you know, I went to college, 18, and I wasn't who I was today or am today. Uh, and his snapshot of me was one uh, just like of my father, right? Uh, overseller, back end seller, street hustler, liar, manipulator, cheater, whatever it may be. And when I invited him to my 50th birthday party, which was for charity, I did 50 birthday parties to raise money uh, for the Unstoppable Foundation, which I'm the chairman of, to build community centers in Africa to help heal the relationships between the generations of the Kenyans uh, there in Africa. And my uncle who sat with all the board members and my family at the event said, oh, I wonder what David's being paid to do this. And my wife was so offended, right? This was, she knew where my heart soul, how much money, time and emotion I'd spent to prepare 50 parties around the world to raise money Four of these and she was so offended and came up to me and was so agitated and aggravated and angry and frustrated and I just looked at her and I said no he's right because that's the snapshot of who he thinks is here and so I decided rule number one of healing a broken relationship is forgiveness forgiveness is the key to heal relationships and you have to start to forgive yourself for the snapshot that people are judging or placing conditions upon you at this time and state of your existence, journey, acceleration, growth, whatever it may be. So many people, they create more separation and break or create more interference in a relationship because they can't forgive themselves for being who they were when they were 13 to 18 or 18 to 28 or 28 or in a past relate. They can't forgive it. And by not forgiving it, you're giving it more power. You're giving more energy to what you don't want, what's missing, or what other people think of you. Instead of giving power through forgiveness, forgiving yourself for learning, for growing, for making mistakes, for setting yourself back, for the failures that are just painful indicators that you had a lesson to learn to push you to a better place, a better situation, or make your situation better. 
Forgiveness is the key to healing the broken relationships, not only of self, but with others because you can't give what you don't have. And if you've forgiven yourself for being that 13 to 18 year old or 18 to 28, 28 to 38 or 53 year old self, if you've forgiven yourself, it's so much easier to give it to others and heal the relationship instead of exacerbating or accelerating the interference that exists between you and everyone else. Communication is effective and we need to stop the nitpicking of, of what we do to people. Stop the judgments and conditions and allow for that forgiveness. How do we heal past relationships? I've uh, healed my relationship before my dad passed away and it was one of the greatest gifts that I uh, was given to myself uh, because I know how important it was uh, to heal that relationship. But it only happened when I healed for myself because regardless of my father's receptivity to my forgiveness of myself, my forgiveness of being an 18-year-old, self-centered, growing young man, regardless of his receptivity to my forgiveness of self and my intention of healing the relationship, I was healed and the relationship was healed. Now, his relationship with self may or may not have ever been healed. Whether he said to me, I love you too, son, I forgive you, I appreciate you doing it, or if he says, look, you know, and came out in anger to me and, and attacked me with conditions and judgments, it's irrelevant. We need to figure out, just like an ego trigger, the identifiable things that we can look at to an unhealed relationship trauma. Because the healing starts within ourselves. And so one of the signs that you have an unhealed trauma is you feel physically drained. Remember, we're talking cell to soul is how we're healing these relationships. So if you feel physically drained when you are interacting or thinking about in any way, physically, mentally, emotionally with someone else, self, the higher source of power, or someone else, if you feel physically drained, you know there's trauma. You know that there's healing necessary and forgiveness will be the tool, the brush to clean away all the corrosion that exists between you, that person, or you and yourself, or you and the higher power. The second thing that you'll feel is disconnected. You'll feel separate from. Inferior or superior are two of the ones that we feel offended and resentful and guilty are some of the other feelings of separation and disconnection that you'll feel. These are all indicators that you have trauma that needs to be healed within the context of the relationship of the holy triad of self, the higher power of source, and others. And finally, if your mind works differently in the context of a relationship than it does to all other relationships, then you know there's healing that's necessary. Uh, so a traumatic relationship, if we change our mindset around that relationship, in other words, if we're generally into a positive mindset of great gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration, and we get around someone, feel physically drained, separate and disconnected, but also our mindset is completely different, that we stop the ability to identify the trauma, to identify the stop, drop, and roll, that our mind, our bodies, and our souls are on fire, then you know that we have some healing to do. And so these are the identifiers. Now, what is the manifestation of that? Trust issues, right? We develop trust issues. How do we overcome trust issues? I'll tell you only one way that I've learned. Trust everyone, but to overcome trust issues, you need to learn to have a process of vetting, to take accountability for doing the due diligence, to being more interested than interesting, to finding the light, the love, and the lessons, and forgiving that which we find. But if you want to trust or heal a relationship, you need to vet it and ask the hard questions and talk through the truth. And then you can decide which part of the great train, chain of feeding it falls upon. And if you can forgive it, you have healed the relationship. And if you can't, allow it to fall away or fire it from your life. 
Another one of uh, the issues is feeling on edge. You know, I know that in some relationships I get anxious or feel on edge when I'm driving to the party or to the person's house. These are all indicators that we have trauma to heal. If you don't feel at center before you even get there or you don't feel at center when you're there, in the presence of that relationship, we need to heal that. We talked earlier about the liability issue. Liability, when we blame ourselves, when we feel guilty and resentful, when we live in blame, shame, and justification of a relationship, it needs to be healed. The best way to heal that is to take the accountability for it and forgiving ourselves, but asking ourselves, what did I do to impact this trauma? What did I do to separate myself in this relationship? And what am I supposed to learn from it? And just like any other problem, when we learn the solution to the problem, it isn't a problem anymore. Two plus two was very challenging for me when I was young. And then I figured out it was four. No longer was it a problem because I had the solution. Same thing holds true in our relationships in the trauma that we experienced. And if finally you have unjustified anxiety, pure anxiety, where you don't feel as if you are growing and accelerating, instead you are constricting everything, you can't handle anything. If you have that anxiety, then there's trauma to do. So what do we figure out? Number one, just like the triggers of the ego, awareness, is the greatest agent for change. Awareness is your greatest agent for change. We need to live our lives from cell to soul to raise our vibrations so we can be more aware and identify all of the trauma that we've created and the interference between us, the greatest source of light, love, and lessons, ourself, and everything else. Understanding, to be more interested than interesting, will help us heal as we identify and raise our awareness Understanding what other people may or may not have experienced through our relationship. Compassion, empathy, not sympathy. You don't have to walk a mile in the other person's shoes. You can't be poor enough to make them rich. You can't be sick enough to make them well. You definitely cannot be, uh, uh, um, <laughs> can't be sad enough to make them happy. Forgiveness, of course, and learning. We are on constant level of learning to ask yourself, Am I doing my best? And we will talk to you soon. Thanks so much. What do we learn? And most importantly, uh, are we having fun? These are the ways we heal the relationships between self, the triad of the greatest source of power, light, and love, and everyone else. All right. It's time to take the Q&A, my favorite part. We are here on Freedom Friday. We're going to start online with a question and then go to Clubhouse and IG. Mike is going to help me along the way with Jake moderating. Thank you so much. Here we go. First question. Do you learn more from a good relationship or a bad relationship? In the context of this question, I think we realize one of uh, the distinctions of comparison, right? The thief of joy comparison. There is no difference between a good or a bad relationship. Right? A good relationship. So what we learn is in a good relationship or one that we feel better about, what's interfering with us feeling better than that? And in a relationship where we don't feel as good as that, how can we make ourselves feel better? So the real question is, what we learn from good and bad relationships are how can we improve and accelerate and grow all of our relationships so that we feel better through them at all times and make those people feel better. That our relationships are about leaving ourselves in a better place and leaving others in a better place as well. And if you define them as good or bad, just realize they're just relationships. You're giving meaning to everything that you see. When you seek the light, the love, and the lessons in those relationships, when you realize I'm doing my best, I'm just trying to learn something in this relationship and have fun with you, we're all better off. All right, our first guest on Clubhouse is Frederick Bussey. My friend, you have a question for me. Hey, David. Thanks for letting me up on stage. I could see you. Um, I'm glad to be here. And I just wanted to ask a question about, uh, actually about that, about relationships. Um, I launched an M&A firm this year and um, just doing the process of uh, finding deals and things of that nature. So 
where are good places to find deals and how would you go about building relationships with potential partners, investors, or even sellers? I love it. Thank you. I love that question because now we're talking about utilizing healing relationships in a business context to create a community of opportunity. And the best way that we do that is to understand within ourselves our own credibility towards the community that we want and the emotional attachment of understanding and learning and using these tools that I talked about to understand, to ask how and what they like about what I'm doing, what they don't like. But the main context is we need to ask and search for like-minded or open-minded people. If I can find people with an open mind and open heart and open hands, I'm gonna be so successful in all my business relationships by asking one question. Do you know anyone that can help me? See, if I can identify through the awareness and understanding and forgiveness and all these lessons that we've learned today, who has a closed mind, a closed heart, or closed hands, then I can understand not to use my time in the spectrum of the great chain of feeding, where I should be asking. See, too many people find a atypical avatar of who their lowest hanging fruit is or their prospects are. Instead of understanding that the universe is all connected through the greatest source of power light, through themselves and others, to find the open mind, the open heart, and the open hand in order to ask them, are you a sponsor or a power sponsor of mine? What does that mean? A sponsor is someone that knows someone that can help me. A power sponsor is someone that can help me themselves and know someone that can help me. And if you can determine the open mind, the open heart, and the open hand, and utilize that questioning, now you can use the features and benefits to articulate the quantitative value that you're asking for to exceed what you're asking for. The quantitative value of what you're providing to exceed what you're asking for. Using the reasons that it's gonna be helpful, the impact it's gonna have, and the capabilities that you have one or need in order to effectuate that. If people would realize how easy it is to build a community of like-minded, open-hearted, and open-handed people, that people that share a frequency, that tune in to the same level of awareness, and then ask them to be a sponsor or a power sponsor, and run away from or fire from in the great chain of feeding, those that bleed us, Allow those in varying degrees to fall away from us that are not here to feed us, that may or may not be willing to help us with open minds and open hearts and open hands, but to generate our focus, attention, and intention on those people who share a like mind, an open mind, a like hands of open hands, a like heart of open hearts, then we will exponentially grow by simply asking, do you know anyone that can help me do it in person do it on the phone do it via email and do it via traditional and social media exponentially you will grow community of like-minded open-minded open-hearted and open-handed people that will exponentially allow you to build that community in both a personal and professional way thank you so much Great question, Frederick. Uh, look forward. If anyone wants those five uh, ways, credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, capabilities, email me, david at themelter.com. I will send you that five to thrive system. Don't worry about it. My book exercises, guides, all of them, ebook, audio book, I'll sign a book, send it to you, ship it to you. David at themelter.com. Reach out to me. I'm here to be of service. I'm going to take a question online. Winifred, you're up next uh, on Clubhouse. Next question is, how do you identify what is interfering with your relationships? Well, we need to, one, uh, utilize the awareness, forgiveness, uh, understanding, compassion, learning tools that we talked about. Um, I utilize to find that interference, this idea of understanding what creates interference from us. And in this type of relationship, it's usually a few things that are most common. So I go to those first. The need to be right, right? If you in your relationship have to be right, whether the relationship is with self, with the higher power, or with others, if you have a need to be right, you're interfering with that relationship. If you have a need to be offended, you're interfering with that relationship. If in any way you have a need to be separate, inferior or superior, you have and are creating interference. If 
you have guilt or resentment, you're creating interference. If you get angry, frustrated, anxious, if you worry about the relationship, you're creating interference. And we all know through these needs, these triggers, that we simply need to stop, drop, and roll because from cell to soul, we are on fire. And everyone knows when you're on fire, you got to stop, drop, and roll. So identify by the basic needs of interference what we're doing to distract ourselves from what already exists, this unification, this unbelievable flow of energy that stems from the greatest power of source, love, light, and lessons through us with appreciation, meaning we add value to everything and everyone else. And if you're creating that interference, realize it's just a practice. You're not gonna get to perfection. It'll be progress at all times that we're looking for to enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit, pursuit of that truth, of that potential, of that clear, non-interfered connection that you have with the greatest source of light, love, and lessons, yourself and everyone else. All right, next guest up. Winifred, what do you got for me? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, a part of my question, you've already answered uh, with, uh, when you spoke uh, um, to Frederick. So I'm building a community. I'm located here in Charlotte, North Carolina, but I immigrated from my country 30 years ago, and I'm very connected to my country, Nigeria. I'm building a community of um, non-profit organizations that are really doing work in the area of advocacy for the for the girl child. And uh, one of the challenges I'm having is getting businesses to, um, you know, share, selling my idea in such a way that businesses can align with my vision to support these NGOs so that they do not get frustrated and they can be effective in their communities. So I currently have speaker series, I have I'm doing an annual summit for the first time in October. I just started building last year um, because of COVID. And um, so I have speaker series. I do launch and learn. I give the resources that I find. But I need businesses in that community to give back to that community. So how can I sell my idea to a community that they don't, that's not their culture to really come alongside NGOs to support them so that they can, these NGOs can be effective in their work? In, in, in their work. So, so what structures, what systems can I put in place so that businesses can come alongside? That is my question. Thank you. That is a great question. And I do that work today in Kenya with the Unstoppable Foundation. So I'm very familiar uh, with gaining and garnering support from corporations uh, in an area and to show uh, the difficulties that are created, especially for young women in that area. Uh, with the things historically and culturally that have gone on, the systematic socioeconomic bias and, and difficulty that exists. What you want to do is one, make sure that you build your credibility so that people trust what you're doing that will have the impact, sustainable impact that you want to have to affect the change. And then two, work on expanding and accelerating the community outside of Nigeria. Uh, obviously, this whole world is connected, and I know one of the biggest resistance I had when I've garnered support for the Unstoppable Foundation is people would ask me, well, why don't you support a local uh, agency? Why, why don't you help women here uh, in Southern California or in Orange County specifically? What, why? Well, no, this isn't an if or or, right? This is an everything, right? I support all that's relative to me personally, within my family, then within associates, then within my local community, then within my city, then within my state, then within my country, and then within the world. And I am not going to limit myself or separate myself and say that nothing that happens in Nigeria or everything that happens in Nigeria impacts me. Of course it does. It's how can I make it relative to you? This is about healing relationships, drawing in and understanding the credibility of the relationship between the companies that exist around the world and Nigeria and specifically the young women in Nigeria. And what are those impacts? What are the reasons that we want to make an effect and impact that change? And what capabilities do you have with that credibility to impact that so that the value that you're articulating exceeds what you're asking for to help support these Nigerian women. 
we have to look. There's only so much that a company in Nigeria can give if they don't have that much. But yet the impact of Nigeria and Nigerian women will be seen and heard around the world. And you need to elevate the awareness and tie in the credibility, the emotional attachment, and the reasons, impacts, and capabilities to effectively articulate what you're asking for to exceed. Exceed. What you're, what, you're, what you're providing exceeds what you're asking for. Keep on screwing that up, everyone. You wanna make sure that you practice articulating the value of what you're giving to exceed what you're asking for. And so many times we limit ourselves with the world community and the impact that we can have because we don't challenge ourselves to communicate effectively that value of what impact local problems have on the world. And that local problem should be seen through multi- cultural multinational companies to support women across the world to empower them to create the better stronger communities that will someday save this world so uh look outside please reach out directly to me i have a lot of experience in this matter uh, with the unstoppable foundation david at dmeltzer.com thank you so so much okay i'm going to take another question online uh, next guest is Jordanos. Uh, get ready as I will ask this question online. Most of my relationships are surface relationships and don't have a lot of depth. Any advice on creating deeper relationships? Acquaintances are surface relationships. In order to deepen a relationship, you need to be of service and of value and more importantly, believe it or not, as Ben Franklin wrote in his autobiography, you need to ask for help. If you want to strengthen a relationship, allow someone to make an investment into you as well as offer your service or value to other people. And I have a template that I use, which I'm happy to give to everyone. Once again, david at dbelcher.com. The template goes like this. What are you doing today? Especially pertaining to maybe an issue uh, in this relationship that uh, is a common uh, interest or a common activity. What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? If we take our relationships and find a commonality and appreciation between the two of us of some sort of activity or interest, and we ask simply what they like and don't like about it, and when they tell us what they don't like about it, we offer help to shift or engineer or re-engineer what they don't like and then ask them for help pertaining to the common interest or activity, you will deepen the relationship. You will deepen a relationship by knowing your what and who and the how becomes a shared experience. You then can determine and prioritize your activities, the nows in your life with that person in a shared journey or a shared experience. A very simple template, david at dmelzer.com, can go ahead and strengthen and deepen all relationships by taking a common activity, concern, or interest, finding out by being more interested or interesting what they like or don't like about it, and then asking them for the things that they don't like if you could help them like it, and then ask them, do you know anyone that could help you pertaining to the interest or the shared experience, and then be able to determine who and how this is going to happen, which then will deepen the relationship because you will become an investment of theirs and they'll be an investment of yours. And that shared clearing of interference of separation will be determined and healed by that template of asking for the common interest, what they like and don't like, how you can be of service and do you know anyone that can help me? Use it. Reach out to me. That template has changed my life in business and personally by deepening and, and strengthening my relationships by being radically humble and asking for help. Okay, our next guest, Jordanos, you're up. Thank you so much, David, and thanks, Jake, for inviting me um, up to speak. I just want to ask, David, um, so for me, I struggle to make decisions um, that align with my, like myself or my values. Um, so I'm specifically talking about career um, decisions. So when I'm weighing options, it's really hard for me to pick. Even though my intuition is good, I just find that I struggle to make the right decisions that's best uh, for me. Um, so I want to ask you what's the best method for me to, to um, 
make a decision or help me narrow down the uh, choices. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you, Donald. So this is a, what I call a softball for me because it's the question I love to answer. I wrote a book called Game Time Decision Making based off of this. And I have the five daily practices so that you know what decisions to make. The reason people don't know what decisions to make or can't say no to people or can't accept no and wait for no is because they don't take inventory every day. See, you got to take inventory every day and not be afraid of change, growth, and acceleration. In other words, not be afraid of changing your mind and telling people you're somebody new and somebody different today than you were maybe as soon as yesterday. Because you have to first step, know your what. What do you want? What do you want personally today? Now, see, when we decide what we want today, we're taking into context all the future aspirations, goals, and objectives that we have a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, or a lifetime. They're all aggregated and condensed into my decision of what concerning what the activity I plan, don't have planned in my sleep, what I want today. What do I want personally, experientially, giving wise and receiving wise. What do I want concerning all four of those? And when I know what I want, I can then ask myself who could help me and who could I help? Then I can figure out the how. And when things arise that aren't planned or arise or adapt the things that I do have planned in a different context than what I expected, or even some changes in my sleep, which is equally important to what I have planned and I don't have planned, I'm able to determine my what, my who, my how, which then leads me to my now. What is my now? What can I do? What decisions can I make? How do I prioritize the activities in my day? Because we're all given 24 hours a day of activity. That's the stagnant, stable data that I have. It's how productive, accessible, and gracious am I with that activity, aligned or in the trajectory of what I want, not what other people want, what's missing or what you don't want, but what you want. And if you know your what, your who, your how, and your now, you now can apply your why by determining in making decision of what's most important to you, not what's most urgent. There's a matrix by Eisenhower that I talk about all the time, important versus urgency. And we want to do what's most important for us. We want to do it now because 100% of the things you do now get done and passionate, purposeful, and profitable people get stuff done 100% of the time. But too many people don't know how to make a decision because they haven't done the work to determine every day what, who, how to determine the now and apply the why. Apply the passion, the purpose, and gain the profitability of abundance of more than enough. If anybody wants those five daily practices, along with any other templates or my book, david at dmeltzer.com. What a great question. Thank you. That's what I call a softball for me. Uh, I'm going to take another question online. The next guest on... Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you, but do you listen to your intuition? If you have a like, uh, history of... When, you know, when I listen to my intuition, most of the time I'm right, but when you're making decisions, do you also listen to your inner self or do you just base them on the why? Well, see, that's when we're applying the why, we're applying our intuition to the now, right? We're applying the way that we feel. And then I go ahead and I reconcile the way that I feel, the emotional context of my intuition, the gut, with the trust and bet of alignment with my what, my who, and my how. And so if I have a feeling, the only thing I know about that feeling is that something energetically is not aligned. I don't know specifically the facts because I am now trying to analyze something that I don't have the capability of analyzing. Let me give you an example. I go to a business meeting and something, my intuition says something's not right about this deal. This person doesn't seem right. And then I go ahead and make the leap of analysis and say the reason that it doesn't feel right is because I shouldn't do this deal and this person is dishonest or lying or somehow exaggerating, overselling or back end selling. But the truth is, is that person just got into a car accident on the way to the meeting that we're having and is distracted from or his energy is off because of the disruptive activity that occurred that was unexpected. Here's where people get into deeper difficulty with intuition. Intuition is an indication that something's not aligned, but it does not give you the power of analysis of what that is. So in order to determine it, yes, 
You take the intuition and applying your why the way you feel, applying your passion and emotion the way you feel to a situation and aligning by trusting the person. But more importantly, when the intuition tells you there's a problem or interference, vetting, asking more questions to see if you are still aligned personally, experientially giving and receiving wise. See, the process of dreading, tr trusting and vetting allow you to reconcile the emotional side of intuition with the pragmatic side of what you want, who can help you, who you can help, how you're going to get it done, and what you should be doing now according to the what, the who, and the how. And if you do that, if you can combine the power of your feeling, the power of intuition, with the pragmatic application of what, who, how, and now by vetting, asking the hard questions to see where the alignment, the synergy, and the supplementary behaviors are, you will make game time decisions. You will be able to make those fourth down and goal touchdowns. You will live in the enjoyment of the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. And this is something that I want everyone to blend, the pragmatic world with the world of faith, and you will have efficiency, effectiveness, and statistical success in what you want. Did that help you uh, reconcile those two? Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. I love the questions. They're amazing. All right, I'm going to take a question online, and then Sergio, you will be maybe our last, depending on uh, the next two questions. We've got about seven minutes left. All right. What if I don't want to forgive someone who did me wrong? Now, there's an honest person. What if I don't want to forgive someone who did me wrong? Well, then you got some progress to make, my friend. What reason could you give yourself to not want to forgive somebody else? See, we don't forgive other people because they deserve it. We forgive other people because we deserve it. So why punish yourself? Why create separations, voids, obstacles, and interference in your life because you have a need to be right, offended, separate, and inferior, and superior, and guilty, and resentful? Why would you do that to yourself? Why? Why would you create more interference between you and the greatest source of love, light, and lessons and everything else? Why would you fail to appreciate all that you've been given by doing your best, learning lessons, and having fun? And the easiest way to do it is to forgive yourself so you can forgive others. If you don't want to forgive someone who did you wrong, then go ahead and start practicing ending fear in your life and switch it to joy. Remind yourself, I do not forgive anyone because they deserve it. Because I deserve it and I can give it away. Shift your paradigm and perspective of forgiveness. Know that the only certainty and happiness and health and wealth and worthiness will only come from, only come from your reconciliation of striving to forgive the unforgivable. Those people that run within the context and the spectrum of forgiving the unforgivable, live with peace and certainty and love of themselves and they can give it away and they're connected thoroughly through and to all else. The most powerful source of love through them with appreciation, forgiveness and accountability to everyone else. All righty, our next guest, Sergio, what do you have for me? Hey, David, how are you, brother? Amazing. Hey, uh, great, great to hear you again. Uh, you know, you were on my show on Game Changers a while back and, uh, and made a big splash there. And I'm just here to support you and, and listen to all the, uh, all the great messages you got going on here with, with everybody in the room, buddy. So no questions, just here to show some love and, uh, and uh, keep it up, my brother. Oh, uh, you're too kind and thank you for the love commercial. I appreciate everyone uh, who shows up who listens to the replays on Spotify on the playbook, who watches Two Minute Drill and Elevator Pitch and Office Hours and IG Lives, everyone out there I'm so grateful for, and especially you, Sergio, for coming on and acknowledging uh, the effort that we're making to create a collective consciousness of happiness. All right, last but not least, Renee, would you like to come up and ask a question? Hi, David, and everyone else, welcome to Chase the Slowest Frederick, and I'm um I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I will ask you a question because it's always wonderful we're able to learn from you and you just always are a wealth of knowledge. One of the things that I want to help, um, you know, the, the transitioning and what we're doing with the youth, 
because you know I'm very passionate about really helping to empower them. Probably right now, giving them the option. Providing our, our students right now with ways of allowing them to get in front of more items to read, building that awareness, as well as um, putting them in the limelight for them to take on new responsibilities. One I'm having a challenge with, you know, even though we're interacting with the kids for a summer school, how can I help to bridge that gap with their parents? Because that's a piece right there that I'm probably having a little bit more of a challenge with, and maybe you can provide me with some insight in regards to how I can help make that transition for the so that the parents are more involved with the students learning as well. I love it, and uh, having four children of my own, uh, I can appreciate uh, the difficulty uh, and the interference in healing that relationship and understanding the lessons that could be learned, the mutual lessons from parents to students, students to parents. Um, let me tell you one of the approaches that I take, even in the context of my business. You have a philosophy, people don't listen to you, they watch you. And therefore, if you're looking for what they're listening for, and you're acting in a corresponding way to what they're listening for, then you can have an impact on your children by acting in a manner or a way that they will pick up on. See, we're planting seeds as teachers. We're planting seeds as parents. Seeds that we may never sit under, uh, you know, seeds of trees that we may never sit under. Uh, and I have a classic example. One of my kids came home from college and actually had a professor that quoted me directly. And my daughter's like, oh my God, he's such a genius. Can you believe he said this? And I was like, yeah, because he took it from my video. Uh, look, it's in my book. Uh, they watch you. They don't listen to you. So you need to listen and understand what they're listening for and act appropriately. So what I would do to inspire that clearing of the interference is I would have the students uh, intentionally watch their parents. So what I would love to do is create a project where kids come home and you give them an assignment to observe their parents and list out the positive and negative behaviors that they want to have. Then have them come back and then interview their parents about those behaviors, realizing where maybe they're honest with themselves, maybe they're not, where they illuminate, where they're vulnerable, and then have them understand the personality traits, the characteristics, the obsessions and addictions that are aligned with what they saw. Knowing that quantum in their nature, proven technologically, biologically, that some of those personality traits, characteristics, obsessions, and addictions are theirs. And that they can then heal themselves and heal their relationship with their parents. Learn by watching and by asking. Allowing them to clear the interference and understanding, raising their awareness of that very valuable relationship. But even more importantly, allow the parents to do the same. So I would have them observe uh, their parents, write down the characteristics, positive and negative, and then interview them and see where those are reconciled. The lessons that would be learned from those relationships would be extraordinary. I want to thank you so much, Renee. I know you're breaking up a little bit there. It is noon. I am a time freak. I'm keeping everybody on the Freedom Friday holiday schedule. You're not going to be late. Just a few closing notes. Next week, topic, passion, purpose, and profitability. We're going to talk about my three favorite peas. Two Minute Drill Season 2 tonight on Bloomberg. Check it out, 8.30 tonight. You can check out Season 1 and 2 on Amazon Prime Video. But check it out. I love it on Bloomberg tonight, 8.30 p.m. Bloomberg TV. Uh, go ahead and Google that. And then email me if you need anything. The Healing Your Relationships Guide, ebook, audiobook, my, of course, signed copy sent to you, paid for by me or any of the other templates that I mentioned, you can always reach out seven days a week. I answer it myself, not the longest emails back, but they are from me, david at dmeltzer.com. Remember everyone, we appreciate the first responders, the military families and veterans. Thank you so much for providing us the freedom to make the choices and have the opportunities that we have, to have the freedom to be kind to our future self and do good deeds. We'll see you this holiday. Bless you all. Paying each week for more than $50,000 in cash and prizes. Five contestants.